Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Ben Levine, who's going to talk today about how to secure hardware. Ben, there's been a lot of interest in both Meltdown and Spectre in terms of these are ways of compromising hardware. Is this the first time that we've seen the, the hardware uh, as the target, or typically what we've seen in the past is a lot of software attacks? Yeah, there have been a lot of attacks on hardware as well. Uh, Meltdown and Spectre have got a lot of attention recently, and I think for good reason, because they're very widespread attacks that have real consequences for systems uh, that contain sensitive data. But there's a long history of attacks on hardware of all sorts, including you know large CPUs like the uh, AMD and Intel and ARM CPUs that were the subject of ARM and Spectre and, and other types of hardware as well, including things like smart card chips and secure elements and, and TPMs and so forth. Wherever there's interesting data, uh, keys, interesting information for attackers uh, to, to be interested in attacking, they're going to find some way to, to try and get that out. So what's the strategy here? How do we go about securing this? Yeah, I mean, there, there are different strategies, but there's sort of one approach that, that we think makes sense, particularly when you're talking about a complex system or a system on chip. You know, uh, modern CPUs are very complicated. Uh, they have what we would call in the security area a large attack surface, meaning because of that complexity, there's a lot of different avenues for an attacker to uh, get into the system and, and cause a compromise. So, you know, one approach that we think makes sense in a lot of cases is rather than trying to solve this really difficult problem of how do you secure this, you know, really complicated thing, you know, let's look at a different problem, and that's how do we secure something simpler? Take the security functionality out of the sort of general purpose domain and create a secure root of trust that's a foundational layer for security in the system. And now you have a simpler problem. You have a smaller component, you have this root of trust that you can design very securely and use that to build the security of your system. Rather than trying to make the entire system secure, you isolate it to this one region and then you can focus your attention there. Really what you're doing is narrowing the attack surface here, right? Exactly right, yeah, and, and you know, doing security well takes time and effort and you need to focus on all of the ways an attacker could compromise your system. It's, it's hard because you, know, you have to protect every avenue an attacker could get in and the attacker only needs to find one weakness. So the smaller you can make that problem and the less area there is to focus on, the better chance you have of protecting your system. Why don't you draw this out for us? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. What are we looking at? So I'm showing you a very, very simple uh, concept here on the left, and that's that you have a system on chip of some sort, and that could be you know, a very large, complicated uh, multi-core processor. Uh, it could be an IoT chip. Really, anything that has uh, processing and requires security, which is more and more uh, silicon these days. And rather than trying to put the security in the general purpose processing domain and, and make that really hardened against attackers, because like I said, that's very difficult to do. We're going to silo out the security into a separate secure root of trust. And then the root of trust, we're going to build out of some components that we can make very secure. So we want some sort of secure CPU with its own private memory. We probably want some hardware for various cryptographic operations like AES and SHA. We need a secure place to store keys. And we can have various other components uh, that are specific to the application for things like protecting test and debug, or controlling features on the chip, or various interactions with other parts of the SOC, like analog sensors. We've been used to thinking about security as layers. Where does this fit into the layers? Yeah, it's a great question. So when they say we're going to move security out of general purpose processing into the secure root of trust, I'm not saying that there's no concern for security now in the general purpose processing domain, but we now have a very secure foundation. And then we can build our security in layers on top of that foundation. And the things that need to be most secure, like protecting keys and protecting uh, the secure operating environment for the suite of trust, that's all secured in this hardware domain that's designed specifically for security it will be very difficult for an attacker to breach. So is the idea that you keep everybody out, or is the idea that if something fails, you can restart the device? 
Well, some of each, it really depends on the specific application. But in general, if we could just say the secure root of trust, you know, lives by itself and doesn't talk to anything and, you know, completely lock it down, we could make it really, really secure. But unfortunately, it wouldn't do much good. So there needs to be some interaction between the outside world and the root of trust. So you have to find ways to, to get data and control information in and out of the core in a secure way. Um, and then in addition, the secure root of trust can be monitoring what's going on not only within itself, but also within the general purpose domain. And then based on what it sees in terms of attacks, it can take various actions from just signaling some sort of alert to completely halting and restarting the system. Depends on what's appropriate for the situation. In the past, we've tended to think about security as we've already got a system here, we now need to secure it somehow, basically layering on security. What you're talking about here more is more of a design for security type of approach, right? Exactly right. Uh, taking an existing system, particularly an existing complex system, and trying to add security after the fact, really, really hard to do. And there are things that are done, for example, in the case of Meltdown Inspector, there are things that were done for performance that opened up security holes, uh, like the speculative execution and so forth that are, are exploited by Meltdown Inspector. Um, and then trying to go back and fix those is a much more difficult problem than just not doing them in the first place. And if we have a secure root of trust, we don't need to go to extremes to improve the performance. Instead, we can start with something simple that's designed from the ground up for security. And then as we build that subsystem, we can do everything with security in mind. And that's the architecture, it's the microarchitecture, it's the design style, it's verification. Really, if you can focus your security in one area, you can go to a lot of lengths in terms of making sure that's very secure. So if you really want to make this a design for security type of strategy, how far back into the hardware design do you have to go? Really, you want to go as far as possible. Um, I mentioned the sort of root of trust we're talking about has a secure CPU. And you have a couple of options there. You could take an existing CPU or microcontroller and build your system around that. And while that may be a simpler CPU than you know, a modern multi-core processor, there are still some things in, in legacy CPUs that are designed for reasons other than security. So ideally, you'd like to even go back in far, as far as designing your own CPU for security applications. Now, you know, starting from a completely clean sheet of paper for a CPU is difficult. But one thing that we're really excited about is RISC-V, because RISC-V has a really solid ISA and a really solid you know, computer architecture, but there's no legacy microarchitecture there's no legacy constraints on what you do with the RISC-V processor, particularly when it comes for designing for security. So we see RISC-V as an enabler for, for all kinds of special purpose CPUs, uh, but also we think it's really an effective place to start for a secure CPU that you can use as part of a, a root of trust. How much of this has to be active type of uh, security versus passive type of security? One of the problems in the past is that there's been a lot of security measures that have been out there that have been available, but they really haven't been instituted in a lot of the products that have, have hit the market. Yeah, I mean, you know, having security present but not using it as part of your overall system strategy doesn't help you. Um, you need to, if you want to secure your system, take advantage of all the security that's available to you. Um, anything that's foundational in the silicon that you can use, any layers of software you can build on top of that, you want to take advantage of that. You really have to think of the, the fact that attackers are constantly working to come up with new ways to compromise systems, and you can't be passive. You need to be very proactive in not only trying to build a system that's secure from the beginning, but also a system that's flexible enough to adapt to new threats and, and to come up with new countermeasures as new attacks are developed. And one issue that has uh, surfaced more recently is that some of these chips are going to be used for maybe 7, 10 years, maybe even 15 years. Talking about security today needs to be in the context of what comes later. So th you think about the GPAC, for example, that was an old system that got hacked years later. What happens with the security here? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, security is always 
a changing domain. Attackers are always getting better, and you need to have a system that lets you react. So one thing that we feel very strongly about when you're building a route of trust, you need one that's fully programmable. There have been routes of trust that have been developed that have fixed purpose hardware that's great you know, in a particular instance, but don't have the flexibility to adapt over time. So we think that if you make your root of trust programmable and you have the opportunity to uh, you know, update firmware, then you can update your root of trust to be secure against new attacks as they arise. And you have to take that you know, flexible approach and that approach that lets you, you know, update and upgrade your security wherever that's feasible. Of course, you want to start from a secure place, as secure place as you can, but you also want to have the ability to build on top of that. And for that, you really do need a programmable solution. Do we need something like uh, motion detectors for data inside of some of these devices in addition to the secure root of trust? Is it all about keeping people out, keeping certain things safe, or is it also about understanding how traffic is moving through these systems? No, I think it's both. Um, you need to, again, have a secure foundation, but you also need to be aware of what's going on in the larger system, and that can include things like looking for unusual patterns of communication, like a device that's suddenly talking to lots of different servers it didn't use to talk to, uh, or looking for unusual patterns of data. And if you have a secure route of trust and you design your system appropriately, you now have a monitor that can look at what's going on in the system, and if it notices something strange, it can take some action. And that could be something simple, just like raising alert, uh, an alert at the OS level, uh, or it could be something more drastic, depending on the application, like shutting down the system and restarting it. But as long as you have something that you trust, you can use that as the you know, foundation for the monitoring of other things that maybe you don't trust as much. What does this do for the overall cost of a system? Because one of the things that we found in security is that people typically, particularly end consumers, don't want to pay for it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the more security you add, the more overhead there's going to be, right? You could build a, uh, you know, security function into every part of your system, um, and maybe you would get better security, maybe not, because you're making it more complex, but the idea is you're going to have a lot of overhead. So you need to find the right balance you need to provide you know, enough security and security that can be upgraded, but you can't put too much of a burden on the overall system. So I think that's an important thing for people designing security to do, is really think about, okay, what are the constraints of my system? What's the attack surface? And come up with the right balance between security and you know, the, the area that's required, um, you know, additional memory and so forth, all the different things that that costs to a chip. You need to make sure that your security is appropriate and affordable. But we think that is possible. If you're careful and clever about how you're building a secure subsystem, you can develop a, a secure route of trust that's you know, reasonable in area and something that's affordable for a pretty wide range of chips. Let's go back to uh, what you were talking about here with security by design. What do you need to keep in mind as a system designer, as a, an engineer, that, as you're developing these systems? Yeah, I mean, security is one of those things that the more you look at it, the, the harder it seems. Um, at the sort of first level, you know, people often start thinking, well, if I encrypt my data, then I'm safe. Um, but there's more to that. Now you have keys that you need to protect. Well, how do you protect those keys? You need to store them somewhere. So there's, there's sort of layer upon layer of things that you need to think about when you're designing a secure system. And you really need to then start from scratch and think about everything you do and security should really permeate everything you're doing as you design a secure subsystem. It starts at the architecture level, but it also involves microarchitecture. It can even involve your you know, RTL coding style. Certainly involves verification. You want to do verification in the way that helps you identify vulnerabilities. So you know, security is kind of its own discipline, and it requires you know, realistically a lot of experience uh, and a lot of thought and a lot of care to build something that's really secure. So one of the big changes, particularly with the IoT, IIoT, is that now everything's connected. What does that do for security? Yeah, it changes the game quite a bit. Um, before we saw so many connected devices, you know, the, the 
threats were more limited because typically someone needed to be in physical possession of a device um, and now devices are connected so attacks can come from literally anywhere in the world. Also, as things are more connected, there tends to be more data that's involved, and that data has value. And that can be things like a security camera. So, you know, the old days you had the security camera that was connected by a wire directly to a recording device. It was very difficult to attack. Now security cameras are connected to the internet, and they have interesting information for attackers, right? They have video streams that may give attackers information about you know, who's in your home or what's going on. So you have more and more valuable data that needs to be protected, and at the same time, you have more and more threats because they can come from anywhere. So the need for security, particularly in IoT devices, but in lots of other things that are becoming connected, like automobiles, uh, it's, it's a tough situation, right? Because you have more valuable things for, for attackers to steal and more attackers out there to protect against. So security is becoming really more and more important and something that you really need to be thinking about from the beginning when you're building really any kind of connected system. Ben Levine, thanks for a great explanation. You're welcome, Ed. Thank you.